Secretary of State Jesse White, thank you for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Glad to be on board. Well, wonderful to be with you again. It's been a long time, and we uh, love you. Uh, appreciate you giving us the time to visit with you. And we really don't want to talk so much about current public policy, uh, but let's uh, want to visit with you. Uh, as long as you have been around, and that's been a long time in public office, first elected to the state legislature in 1974, you've been elected six times now, Secretary of State. Uh, you have a, uh, a long history, of the, but I think a lot of people around the state still may not know some of your interesting backgrounds and what you did before you got into government. So let's start back that, as I understand, you were not from Chicago originally. You are actually from Alton, Illinois. Yes, I was born in Alton, Illinois, and at age seven moved to Chicago and have been living there ever since. And uh, I, I'm told that when you were in Alton, you remember sometimes what the Mississippi River coming up and flooding, and uh, sometimes that would cause some problems for you. Sure. I lived in an area called Dogtown, and whenever it would rain, we'd have to swim. <laughs> <laughs> Was it kind of a low? It's, a, it's a, at the bottom. It's, the Mississippi River has a tendency to find our location. And then, so at seven years old, you go to Chicago. Yeah. What brought you to Chicago? I mean, why did your family go up there? The quality of life. Uh, my father was a darn need of a better job. And so uh, my grandmother and grand grandfather invited us up, and we moved into an apartment within a building. And uh, then later on, the entire family moved to Chicago in an Italian, in an Italian neighborhood. We had to learn to speak Italian. <laughs> He's the linguine. Did you Canada actually learn to speak it? A little bit, yeah. Uh, that's quite a, a cultural difference, I think, going from Alton to Chicago. Do you remember your first impressions when you saw Chicago and just the size of it? I was fascinated by the size of the buildings. And we always looked forward to going downtown and uh, looking up at the tall buildings. And one fellow said to me uh, when I was in college, working at Brock's Candy Company, I, would, I was eating the candy. He said, you're new. I said, how do you know I'm new? He said, because you're eating the candy. And when people come to Chicago and they look up, you know that they're not from Chicago. <laughs> and then you went along, uh, and you were growing up during a certain time, during World War II. You were yes. a, a young child then. Yes. Do you remember any of the war years? and? What, uh, what the feeling was in America during that time period? I know that uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm about how well we're going to do with regard to the war. And then we were on public aid, so we'd have those little coins and paper that we had to take to the store in order to get the food stuff that we wanted. Uh, those were di difficult times, but we learned to adjust and uh, become what we are today. And then, obviously, the war came to an end. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, do you remember the day the war ended? Do you remember the celebrations and all? Uh, a little bit. I don't know what sticks in the mind of a young <laughs> child. <laughs> I was glad that it was over. It uh, brought a lot of sanity back into the community. And uh, one of the things that I liked about Chicago was that uh, we learned to speak about four or five different languages because of the ethnicity of the community. And we learned to get along well with one another. And there was no discrimination. Uh, they all, all banded together to try to help one, uh, help one another to get from point A to point B in life. I would imagine that was interesting that that impacted you and noticed that at a young age. But it probably is something that's carried through uh, subconsciously maybe with you. But from going to an Alton to uh, Chicago, as you say, and, and seeing all the ethnicities, it kind of makes an immediate impression that it's a big world out there. Sure. You learn to speak the various languages, and you learn to acquire a love for the food, and it's, it's, it was a great time in my life. <laughs> now, what, at what point did you become, a, I presume you became a Cubs fan early on? Uh, well, at age seven, I left Alton, Illinois, and moved to Chicago with my family, and we still had some concern about the Cardinals, Marty Kurowski, Marty Marion, Red Shane, East, Stan Musil, those guys. But then 
you're living in Chicago, so now we have a different kind of a team. And so when people ask me, what are my favorite teams? Cubs, Cardinals, and White Sox are not necessarily in that order. <laughs> really? And I was just hoping that the Cubs, Cardinals, and White Sox would have advanced to the World Series this year, but uh, it didn't happen. Well, the cards came close. They did. <laughs> and I get a, as a Secretary of State uh, promoting the Oregon Tissue Donor Program, I travel to Wrigley Field and I throw the pitch out promoting the Oregon Tissue Donor Program. Then, sometime a few, a few weeks later, go to, uh, I always call it Comiskey Park or say you feel uh, whatever the name of the park is, I throw the pitch out again promoting the Oregon Tissue Donor Program. Then I'm down at Bush Stadium doing the same thing. Beautiful ballpark. Have you been to the new ballpark in St. Louis? Many times. Yeah. Great ball, ballpark. It's interesting to me. I mean, where we have Wrigley as one of the first generation parks. It's almost uh, the new Bush Stadium is kind of a replica, you might say, of those first generation ballparks. Great ballpark. Just, just up, yeah. Uh, what I find fascinating, then you went on to college. Were you the first one in your family to first go one, to college? Yeah, I was the first one to attend college. Uh, I was a basketball player in high school. I averaged about 30 points a game. And after I'd graduated, Beloit College said, we'd like to have you, but I didn't have a sequence in math. Whereby College said, we'd like to have you, but you don't have a sequence in math. Northwestern said, we'll take you, no sequence in math. And then uh, Tennessee State, out of Nashville, Tennessee, said, we want you. Oh, but you're too short. You're only five, eight and a half. So the Alabama State, Montgomery, Alabama said, we'll take you. And sure enough, I was enrolled at that wonderful institution. Dr. Martin Luther King uh, was, my, was my pastor when I was there. So it was the basketball. Yeah, I was playing basketball. But Ralph Abernathy, who was the president of our fraternity, uh, insisted upon us attending this church in Northern, the northern part of Montgomery. And Dr. King was the minister. He had just come in from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were required to attend this church. And we learned a lot from it. And then playing basketball and being the captain of the team, he used to meet me after every basketball game and give me $20. Is that right? Yes. What was, what kind of a, I mean, that's one of the things I wanted to bring up, the fact that you interacted with Martin Luther King. Sure. What kind of a guy was he? A wonderful human being. Wonderful. And he was pretty young when you, I mean, he wasn't much older than you. He was a few years older, yes. Three years, is he? Three or four, something like yeah. that. Yeah. But he's a wonderful man. So he saved me $20 after every game. That was legal then. It's not legal now. <laughs> and uh, so at church, a lady by the name of Rosa Parks had been uh, arrested. Did you know Rosa Parks? No, before? I didn't know her. Okay. And so he indicated that he had been asked by the city fathers to uh, help bring about integration and, and break the backs of the uh, people in Montgomery who insisted upon uh, blacks sitting, it was called colors then, sitting in the back part of the bus. And so he indicated that he was a student of Gandhi, and Gandhi was instrumental in bringing about independence for the Indians from the British, and he used a nonviolent means approach in order to do so. Mm -hmm. And so he says, that's, a, what, that's what I'm going to do. So if someone strikes you on one cheek, you turn so you get struck on the other cheek. I raised my hand. He says, Jesse White, what can I do for you? I said, Dr. King, you know me, you know me well, and you know I'm from Chicago, and we don't operate like that. He says, I understand. Just follow the script, okay? I said, okay, Doc. So I had a great experience with him. Was it what he said? Was it uh, Dr. King's personality? What, what impressed people, not only yourself, but others, uh, to follow his lead? He was honest. And he loved all people. And see, I had come from an integrated environment, so I, he and I were sitting out of the same hymn book. Mm -hmm. Because I lived in a predominantly Italian neighborhood. And my school was fully integrated. And uh, I just learned a lot from him about loving my fellow man and woman and never ever disliked anyone because of race, creed, or color. 
found out that it's the worst thing in life and the worst you can ever do. When you went from Chicago to uh, Montgomery, I guess is where, wasn't it, where you were in school, uh, where you had the segregated South then, was, it, was that a shock to you uh, coming from Chicago? Uh, it, it was, it was. Uh, I was given a full scholarship. I was required to play baseball, basketball, and I taught gymnastics. And uh, when I got on the bus, I was relegated to going to the rear of the bus because they had a sign up with the, with the arrow pointing, it said colored, and that was to the rear, whites to the front. I had never experienced that before. And uh, so I was sat on the, in the wrong part of the bus one day, matter of fact, the first day down there. And the people in the back of the bus who are African Americans, uh, they kept beckoning to me to come back beyond the line, mm -hmm. the sign. And I ignored them. And so the bus driver looked at me and he said, can't you read? I said, yes, I can. What can I do for you? He said, you're sitting in the wrong part of the bus. I said, bus driver, your responsibility is to drive the bus and collect fares. I gave you my money. And he says, you have to sit behind that sign. I said, I'm not going to sit behind it. I'm going to sit right here. So when I got off the bus downtown, I was inundated with some of the people who were riding on the bus. And they, they reminded me that down south, if you violated their code of conduct or the rules, you could very easily get locked up, and in some cases get beaten. Well, on my way back down to the campus, I got to the rear of the bus. <laughs> did, you, did you meet Rosa Parks? I have never met Rosa Parks. I've seen her many times, but never met her. But Dr. King, I probably have seen him a hundred times. When, when he became more famous, uh, well, he became famous, I guess, right after the bus uh, strike, and became increasingly so, certainly in, in leading up to uh, the March on Washington of 63. Did you ever have opportunities to uh, speak with him again? I went into him periodically, especially at the basketball games. Uh, I hold a school scoring record in basketball, and so he loved basketball, and he would meet me, as I indicated before, at uh, the door leading to the gymnasium, and he'd give me $20. Jumping ahead then in 68, the spring of 68, he was assassinated. Do you remember that day, and what, how did you react to that? That was, I was teaching school, and one of the students, they, they used to go home for lunch, he came back and he says, uh, Mr. White, uh, Dr. King's been shot. I said, what? He says, Dr. King has been shot. And then he later said, I asked the question, is he dead? He said, I think so. So then I had a radio and I turned it on in the classroom. And there was not a dry eye there. Yeah. 68 was not the best of our years all the way through. Uh, Let's go back about 10 years prior to that or so. Uh, there is a period of time then when you joined the military. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. What happened was uh, I, I had come home from, from college after having graduated, went out to Wrigley Field to trial for the club, for the Cubs. And as it turned out, there were about 250 of us trying out. They only took five and I was one of the five and I was supposed to return to Mesa, Arizona, or go out to Mesa, Arizona uh, in 57. And as it turned out, four days before it was half me to leave, I was drafted into the Army. So instead of going to spring training, going to basic training at Fort Underwood, Missouri. And while I was there, I decided I wanted to learn how to jump out of airplanes. So I got transferred after basic training to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And then at Fort Campbell, I had learned how to jump out of a perfect good airplane and then uh, I stayed on there for, the, for two more for the rest of the two years and then it was time for me to get discharged and when I was discharged I came home put my uniform in the closet got my ball bat and glove and flew off to Mesa Arizona to be with the Cubs and uh, as it turned out uh, they sent me to Carlsbad New Mexico because they wanted me to work myself up through the Cubs system so I could eventually play ball for the Cubs. And as it turned out, I did quite well. I batted, I think, 352 or something like that. And each year I would go up. So I played AAA and AA primarily. 
interesting to think that you might have had a, a career and, and right, actually uh, the color barrier in baseball had already been broken at that point. Uh, yeah, but uh, there were still a few people who did not read the script. What was your position? Center field. How, was your, how are you at batting? What you say? I left uh, with a 293 batting average. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, and I was extremely fast, so I used to steal a lot of bases. And one person asked uh, Randy Hundley, uh, who was the hardest man for you to throw out uh, from first to, to second? Uh, Lou Brock? He says, no, Jesse White. Yes. <laughs> so that was quite a compliment. Did you know Lou Brock or any of the other players? Yeah, I knew. Lou and I were part of the Cubs system, and then later on, the Cubs trans uh, traded Lou Brock for Ernie Borneo. Right, 64. He had a bad arm, and uh, <laughs> Lou was a good product. Well, people forget uh, Ernie Brolio won 20 games the year before in 63, <laughs> so it didn't seem lopsided, but I remember Lou Brock, uh, who I think had also been in, I think he was a Marine, if I remember. But, uh, uh, I don't think he went to no. I don't think he went to Okay, well, anyway, I, 64, and then the Cardinals won the series in yeah. 64, yeah. which was one of the great years for St. Louis and Cardinal fans. Um, so you... As you, as you entered your teaching and you go forward, uh, and we're going to advance a little bit, but how did those experiences, let's say, of the, of the military and being in the 101st Airborne, and how did that have a, any kind of an impact that was lasting, you think, in forming your character or the way you approach life? It helped me with my character, but it uh, caused me to lose out a lot because I was not able to fulfill my dream to play professional baseball. I played professional baseball, but played with the Cubs. I played double A AA and triple A primarily. Yeah. But I learned a lot about my fellow man and woman. I learned to uh, live in peace and harmony with my fellow man and woman. I learned a lot about others. <coughs> Excuse me. I learned a lot about other ethnic groups. I learned about five different languages. I learned to eat their food, learn to dance, and learn about their culture. When you do that, it makes for a good relationship. You grew up in the 40s and 50s. Uh, you taught school f uh, or, or were an administrator for about 33 years prior to uh, your, your public career. Uh, and, and then you started at some point uh, the tumblers, which still operate today. Yeah. Let, let's combine some of those. How, how do the kids, you, you still deal with kids, and maybe we might say troubled youth uh, some, but yes. how are the kids of today different than the kids when you were growing up, if, if they are different? And to what extent, uh, what are you trying to achieve? It's, I think, probably more character building, speaking of that, than just learning how to tumble. Well, I teach uh, my young people to love their fellow man and woman and never ever dislike anyone because of race, creed, or color. I teach them to be a gentleman first or a lady first, and the rest is debatable. And I also teach them about being on time, teach them about skills that are going to help them to live a long and productive life and be productive. And so I started what it was called the Jesse White Tumbling Team. Uh, right now we, we had over 18,000 young people. We have 300 young people in training, 275 that make up eight units. We've traveled all over the world, Zagreb, Croatia, Belize, Israel, China, Tokyo, Japan, Hong Kong, Honolulu, Hawaii, the list goes on and on. And uh, it's an eye-opening experience with them because when they come back from like Tokyo or Beijing or, or Honolulu, Hawaii, they come back and they say, hey, I had a wonderful time. I was in Beijing or I was in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. And they have money in their pocket because we pay them whenever we, we go out. It depends upon the, the particular uh, event. Mm -hmm. And uh, they could say, I, I was in Tokyo, Japan, I was in Hong Kong, and, and I had a wonderful time, and I did this, and I did that. And it's an eye-opening experience. And I was going to say as, that. As envy on the part of the person they're talking to. Kind of like we talked about with you, going from Alton to Chicago, you say it's a big city, a uh, big world out there, and for them, 
I think to get out of, for all of us, I think to get out of the neighborhood we grow up in and, and be exposed to more kind of opens your eyes. See, uh, you could brag about where you've been and then talk about how much money you made in the process. I've looked at some of the videos uh, online that there, people can go to YouTube and see uh, the Jesse White tumblers. I've had the opportunity to see in person once uh, when I was at the Museum of Science and Industry. It was uh, jaw-dropping how high these kids go. And how do they not break their ankles when they come down? <laughs> well, we, we, we teach them well. We teach them well. I was a gymnast as a kid. I taught gymnastics in college, taught for the Board of Education, Park District, YMCA. And uh, I was asked to pull in a gym show. And from the one gym show came the Jesse White Tumbling team. And right now we do about uh, 200, wait, 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 300 young people on the team, on eight teams. And we do, turned out about 300 requests, can I put them into our schedule? And we've traveled all over the world, Zagreb, Croatia, Belize, Israel, China, Tokyo, Japan, the list goes on and on. It's a program where we make sure that the kid is ready to do a somersault off the trampoline rather than let him hurt himself. I would think a lot of it is, uh, I mean, I would be fearful just starting out. And I would imagine they are too when they're starting out. It, is a big part of this learning to overcome your fear and then that they, they learn, hey, I can learn to do things and, and move forward? Sure, they, they compete with each other and one kid will say, well, I could do a somersault, watch me. And the other kid says, I can do a somersault, but I spot them because I don't want them to hurt themselves. We've had a few injuries, but the bottom line is this, with all of the kids we have on the team, have had few accidents and we've had a lot of success, successful stories to tell about these young people. Time's always, as I say, our enemy when we're talking on here, because I could talk to you for hours, but let's, we haven't even touched on your career. Why did you decide to go into politics and pursue a political career when you were, had been teaching and been in education all those years? I was, uh, I enjoyed uh, skiing. I used to go skiing every weekend. And, uh, and I always met with George Dunn, who was the former president of the Cook County Board. He was my committeeman, he was my friend, and uh, he said at one of the meetings, uh, Jesse, I'd like to know if you would consider running for state representative. I said, Mr. President, I enjoy uh, knocking on doors, <coughs> circulating petitions, and doing things that would be a benefit to the party. He said, well, Robert Thompson, our state representative, uh, has decided to quit and he was going to retire to Osopolis, Michigan. And so we need a replacement. And we think that you would be an ideal replacement. I said, uh, <clears throat> Mr. President, I don't know what, what kind of a politician I'd be, but I will, can I let you know next week? He said, yes. Well, every weekend I used to go skiing. It's just about in Mancelona, Michigan. And I was never successfully going down this hill that had some unbelievable moguls. And so on this particular day, I went down 12 times without falling. So I came back that Sunday night, Monday morning, I called President Dunn. I said, President Dunn, you have your candidate for state representative. He says, great, you'll do well. I said, by the way, uh, I, I, how big is a, a district? He says, about 100,000. I said, what is the ratio makeup? Oh, about 83% white, 12% black, 5% others. I said, Mr. President, that's like two strikes against me and a curveball coming up. He said, you'll do fine. And then I asked him uh, a few more questions about what area he covered. He said, Lincoln Park, the Palm River, North Street, the Field, the Gold Coast area, Magnificent Mile. I said, Mr. President, I don't know how well I would do with that kind of a makeup. He said, you'll do fine. And so I served 16 years as a state representative and uh, did quite well. And then I was promoted to uh, the Cook County Court of Deeds, served there for about six years. And then I was talked into running for Secretary of State by my friends. And I've been in office for 21 and a half years. Yeah, you've been elected six times, and then most recently, in, as we taped this, uh, last November, about 10 months ago. And one of the things I'm, I'm elated about, and that is, 
I was able to receive more votes than anyone in the history of the state of Illinois during an off-year election. And I think carried all 102 counties. I've done that too, and I want to thank the people of the state of Illinois. For when that. we we hear so much of the uh, partisanship going on in, in politics these days, it seems like over the last 50 years or so, it's gotten more rancorous every every year. People used to be more civil. You're noted as still being just such a gentleman, and, and people from both sides of the aisle have nothing bad to say about Jesse White. What's, this, what's your secret? Well, when I see people on the street or in various locations, they said, you're the only Democrat I've ever voted for. <laughs> and they say it on a regular basis, and I'm honored by that. Did they, and, and, and how about in your own dealings? <coughs> You, you got to have some uh, differences on policy issues for here and there, I guess. I am about service to the people. And if you want some service from me, I'm not going to ask you, are you a Democrat or a Republican? Or did you vote for a Democrat or did you vote for a Republican? I think that you will win that person over by the delivery of service to them. When you uh, have served uh, since you were elected to the Illinois House back in 74, 45 years ago. Let's just talk briefly before we have to wrap. Who are some of the outstanding characters? Let's say, I mean, the Jim Thompson, Jim Megger, some of the governors you've worked with. Well, who are the people that stand out? George Rand is one that stands out. But, uh, you know, he got himself in a little trouble, but he was easy to work with. Uh, Mike Madigan, sometimes people question his integrity. I find him to be an upstanding gentleman. And then uh, Ralph Caporelli, I sat in a little area they called the Mafioso Strip. Larry DePrima, Michael Narduli, and Jesse White, <laughs> the Italian guys. But uh, I enjoyed being a member of the Illinois General Assembly. I like meeting people of diverse ethnic backgrounds, and I'm determined to always, always uh, be kind to my fellow man and woman and never ever dislike anyone because of race, creed, or color, or do anything to them because they are a Republican and I'm a Democrat. If you want service from my office, I'm going to deliver it to you. And I'm not going to ask you whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Let me just ask you before we wrap up, now you're, you're in your, what you say is your last term now? I'm going to go on record with you, indicating that this is my last tour of duty. Uh, I, last November, I said the same thing, but I was drafted, and I will not respond to a draft in the future. What, uh, 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 of what you've done in the Secretary of State's office, and I'll compliment you, last time I had to interact to get a license it was pretty much uh, in and out i mean you know we we often like uh, people around the country like to mock the driver services and all that but I, I have to say i mean when i get my stickers it's pretty much uh, works like clockwork uh, what are you most proud of uh, of some of the things you've done as secretary of state first of all i don't want a person to come to one of my facilities bringing in a duffel bag the lunch pail uh, and doing I want them to be put in a posture by which they will look upon this as a task rather than a, uh, an opportunity to, to receive service in a timely manner, in a highly professional way, and that's what I'm proud of. Mr. Secretary, we could talk to you longer, but we know you got to go, and uh, congratulations on your long tenure and service to the people, and we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Well, I want to thank the people of the state of Illinois for looking kindly upon me and putting their trust in my ability to discharge the services to them that they can richly, that they richly need and deserve. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.